I can't even sit down. I'm so excited. Um, this sort of redefines power lunch. We have all this power and philanthropy, but we don't even need lunch. So this is even better. Um, so we are going to have a great time today really talking about women philanthropists doing it differently. And I think we've got a lot of great differences in diversity in terms of what and how both issues through a business, through a family, different stories and styles about how these women are doing their philanthropy and making a difference. And um, one of the things before we get into the session why we really pulled out women, well, we really do think about women a lot at the Aspen Institute, and especially when I think about it a lot from economic mobility. When we think about the fact in the last 50 years the number of women in the workforce has doubled, that women are fast becoming, the, you know, in many cases, the majority are contributing at least half of the bread as a breadwinner to the family. We are also seeing that uh, women in four out of the five income levels are actually giving more than men. So this is something when we're just thinking about the kind of leadership, the kind of style that women are bringing to philanthropy and the role of um, giving back and investing back, I think we're going to see even more opportunity in the future. And these women are on the front line of that. Um, and one little statistic I just wanted to put out for, um, for everybody from Forbes magazine. Um, sorry, it's not Thomson Reuters. Um, but <laughs> but um, was according to Forbes, over the next four decades, $41 trillion will change hands from one generation to the next, with 70% of this being controlled by women. So I just think when we're thinking about a lot of different ways to think about it, it's really coming from a place of opportunity, strength, and possibility when we think about how women are doing it, how they're going to do it moving forward, and make, frankly, the world a better place. Because as Aristotle said, philanthropy is the love of humankind. And my mentor and sort of hero, Anna Devere Smith, has always talked about how do we crack our hearts open to think about change and making the world the best place it can be. So with that said, I'm going to go over to the panelists. We're going to have a very disciplined program because we're going to build on the theme of values and stories. We are going to go down and hear from each panelist who's going to share a value or a personal experience and how that has shaped her philanthropy, her focus, her style, her why. And then we're going to come on back down the line with a one sentence sound bite, which we know they can all do, <laughs> um, to share one lesson or piece of advice that they've learned throughout their work. Um, after that, we'll go into a bit of questions and answers. Um, I think we'll probably have more conversation. I just want to thank the panelists ahead of time. Each of them have said they're willing to be available outside for some more informal discussion, if that would be of interest. So knowing that an hour can fly by, with no further ado, I do want to say one thing about each panelist, because you have their full bios um, in your uh, ideas book. But one thing about Jackie, um, Jackie is the co-director of the Bezos Family Foundation. Um, she works in partnership with her team and her wonderful husband, Mike. Um, but Jackie loves the intersection between a big idea and passion. What she refers to as a sweet spot of philanthropy. Someone really bringing her head and her heart and, her, and, and the foundation to the table when she thinks about the changes she's trying to make in education and young leadership. Tori Birch, need we say more? Tori Birch, as she's building her company, in incredible ways, has been out there on the road talking about women in entrepreneurship. Um, from as her company is growing and just winning all sorts of fashion awards, at, she has chosen to sort of think about her philanthropy in tandem as she thinks about her company. And when we think about her recent mention and recognition uh, from Forbes again, I guess I'm on the Forbes uh, promo spot, <laughs> as one of the most powerful women in the world in 2010. So having her be thinking from that per perch about philanthropy is just terrific. Um, Merle Chambers. Merle is another fabulous woman who founded and operated an oil and gas company and is, is its first and only woman inducted into the Rocky Mountain Oil and Gas Hall of Fame. That's cool. That's cool. Uh, <laughs> Merle is uh, the founder of the Chambers Family Fund, and you'll hear a lot about her great work. Ann Friedman, Ann Friedman, who is another trustee of the Aspen Institute. She is uh, an educator and is uh, deeply, deeply passionate about literacy. Uh, she is, uh, has served on many boards, of which she has been quite deliberate about each, ranging from Conservation International to her current role as chair of the Seed Foundation Board. Ann is a wonderful leader, both for the Aspen Institute and for Ascent. Um, Lori Tisch. 
founder and president of the Illumination Fund. Um, Lori has uh, a foundation has a long-standing commitment to enable more New Yorkers to take advantage of the rich opportunities that the city has to offer. She is, I've had a chance to sort of see her in action on the national service front, but she's doing stuff on the street corners to the art galleries of New York City in many different ways, improving lives. And then last, but certainly not least, um, our new friend here um, in from London, Monique Villa, from, who is the CEO of the Thomson Reuters Foundation. Uh, Monique, uh, we are thrilled to have her here for her first time at the Aspen Ideas Festival. We're not letting you go back to London, France, or the Globe, or wherever you might like. Um, but Monique had a very distinguished career as a journalist and in the business, and was given the opportunity of which she has just transformed to lead the foundation after the merger of Thomson Reuters, coming together and really bringing her twist to what were the most critical issues out there and how could the Thomson Reuters Foundation really step up to what the world needed it to do in her special way. So with that said, Katie, Katie, <laughs> flying in from New York and wherever, this is why we are a team up here. We are a team, because my talking points couldn't keep up with my new best friend, Katie Kirk. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm a late Boy. ad. <laughs> she is the late and great ad, because if any of you know Katie Boone, so we're just going like to go a little bit off record. Really at Aspen, you're never supposed to have more than two panelists on the stage. We just kept finding more great women, more great women. So if we go a little bit longer, I'm just going to ask you to put all your chairs in a circle, and we're going to do a big story swap. <laughs> But no, we were thrilled. We got the call for Katie Kirk, and this is when we knew we were really on the map, and said, hey, could I come in and join? And we were said, absolutely, because anybody who's been thinking about um, certainly the, the, the profound issue of cancer, which is fast becoming almost the, the number one killer, um, has known that she has stepped up, motivated by loss and heart, to say this is no longer OK. We have to mobilize in new ways. And so with her passion and also her leadership, we are just darn thrilled to welcome you to the family into the circle up here. So thank you so much, Katie. OK, I'm trying to be, so again, I'm trying to be a moderator, and Katie is here. So I'm just like, I'm just all nervous. Because <laughs> you know, you try doing that. I was watching you with Anne Marie, and I was like, oh, geez. Um, no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jackie Bezos to share, us, to kick us off with your story. Thank you. Um, I'm really pleased to be the first speaker because I think now I get to lay a claim to the fact that I have the best job in the world. <laughs> Every day I get up excited to go to the office to work with the amazing people that I share my daily work with, and I'm excited to talk with them about the people that we work for, which are <coughs> children between the ages of birth and the end of 12th grade. Um, that is our sweet spot. I grew up, I think my story is going to be very familiar to a lot of people in the audience and also a lot of people here on the stage. I was born into a family of doers. You know, I, my grandmother lived in a town of 600 people in southwest Texas. If there was anything that anybody in the community needed, Marie was the one that provided that. If it was, you needed a, a pie on your back steps, Marie baked it. If you, if the postmistress was losing her eyesight because of diabetes, Marie found the seeing eye dog. If um, the church burned down, and it didn't matter that it wasn't her faith that the church, the, the Baptist church burned down, Marie rebuilt it even though she was a Methodist. So she was the original community volunteer that I saw in action. My mother became like her mother. My mother was the brownie leader. She collected from March of Dimes. Her arena was a little bit larger because we had moved to um, the East Coast, right outside of Washington, D.C. But her, her arena was larger, but her heart was what she had seen. You know, she replicated that sense of giving. So I think that the story I'm beginning to, 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 to give you today is probably very familiar to a lot, to a lot of women here and men, too. Um, and then, so I, I, I followed their footsteps for many years. You know, I, found ways in my community to do something that I thought was necessary. And then in 1997, when Amazon.com went public, our arena changed greatly. We were now in a position as a family to, do, uh, to have our neighborhood grow a lot larger. So we came together as a family shortly after Amazon went public and discussed, um, so that would be our three children, and at that time, there are three spouses. We didn't have grandchildren yet. Now we have 11, so they've been busy. Um, and we talked about what was an issue that we all knew had shaped our, our world. 
and it was education. And we took it for granted that we were going to have a good education. And yet we knew that that's not the story for the majority of the world. And I do mean, you know, globally that's not the story. So we started di dialoguing about what we thought we could affect as a family and where our heart was. And certainly early childhood education came up very quickly. All of my children were thinking about becoming parents imminently. Um, brain science was rapidly developing about the importance of the first five years of life. Uh, so we decided that that would be definitely a focus for us. And when we found out from the Institute of Learning and Brain Sciences that 700 synapses form per second between the ages of zero and five, we thought, okay, that's kind of like internet. You know, the, 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 rap, the rapid growth of the internet is the only thing that I know that really kind of grows at that speed. So we took on um, early childhood and, and um, we, sub we based most of our, not most, all of our philanthropy there on science. We moved into um, early, um, early elementary school thinking about character development. And in middle school, we're looking at STEM. And in high school, we run leadership programs. And you'll see some of our leaders here on campus. And we're very excited about that. And I just got the 30-second signal, so <laughs> I'm passing it over to Merle. Um, when I was eight or nine years old, I opened a magazine that I can't imagine why my parents left available to me. And I saw a photo essay on lynching. And I knew without reading the text, those images of those young men hanging from those trees was wrong. And I knew that justice and fairness were important to me. And that has really informed all of the work that I have done ever <coughs> since. Now, I have to tell you, I remember as a teenager arguing with my father who told me, there is no perfect justice in this world, Merle. And I, of course, would fight with him. And as an adult, I now understand that there is no perfect justice in this world. But I know that we can do better than that. We can do something along the way. So when I sold um, my oil company, I decided that it was important. Um, in the West, um, Many fortunes have been made out of the minerals, but those fortunes leave the states. And I decided it was a fair thing to do to bring something back to those states. So I started women's foundations in Wyoming, Montana, and Oklahoma. And having been in business, I wanted to get as much bang for my buck as I possibly could. So I made challenge grants of $500,000 a piece in those states. And what I got from that, of course, was that each of those states met those challenge grants. But in doing that, the donors were mostly women. So what happened was I also stimulated and awakened women's philanthropy in those states. Because for a long time, women haven't known or felt that they could claim um, their own giving. One woman said, I'll give you $1,428 because that's what my husband gives to the Boy Scouts. And so each of those states now has a woman's foundation with over a million dollar endowment. Each of those states has given away over a half a million dollars. Um, those states all focused on um, economic self-sufficiency for women and girls, and it's also intended to be long-term and systemic. So in Montana, for a very small amount of money, $25,000, because in those states, 
a little money goes a very long way. Um, they were the champions and leaders of um, getting rid of the horrendous fees paid in payday lending. They brought the percentage of interest payments down from around 600 percent to 36 percent. And since women are big users of payday lending, poor women, those women now can go ahead and take payday loans, which I suspect nobody here uses actually very often. And um, that gives them more money, helping them with their economic self-sufficiency. It gives them more money for their kids. And that is just one of the things that I do. And I can still see those young men hanging from those trees. Um, no, so ever since I was little, giving back is something that I was incredibly interested in. It was something my parents did a lot of. I was around them, but I really thought that uh, when I went on a program in college called Semester at Sea, I went to many developing countries, and I had never seen the poverty that I saw. And from that point on, I knew that at some point in my life, I wanted to start a foundation. Uh, fast forward, I went, I went to Penn and I graduated and a week later I started working in the fashion industry and uh, for about 15 years or so it was more on the business end, marketing, PR and advertising and um, then had three little boys and realized that I couldn't do both well so I took time off knowing that I wanted to start a business and knowing that I wanted to start a foundation. So. Um, about four years later, um, I decided to come up with a business plan that was talking about what I thought was a white space in the market, and it was this idea of accessible luxury. It was beautifully made clothing that didn't cost a fortune, but then it had a level of social responsibility, and the company would think about how we could best be used as a platform to give back. I went to raise money, and most of the men that I spoke with said that I should absolutely never say social responsibility and business in the same sentence. And so I thought that was really interesting and something that I personally wanted to change. So we um, started the company eight years ago, and we always have thought about uh, social responsibility and how we can partner with different organizations, how we can give back. If, when Japan had the tsunami, how we can raise money with a t-shirt and sell and then give a certain amount to the Japanese Red Cross. But then what was my, the love of what I was really trying to do from day one was to start a foundation. So two years ago, we did start a foundation. It empowers women through microfinance and mentorship domestically. Because when I started to learn about what women's needs were, were is that it was more difficult for a woman to get a loan in the United States than it was in a developing country. And I thought that was really hard to believe. So I did a lot of research. I thought that women are our best investment. Um, I could best contribute by what I personally knew, and that was a startup. And that was somewhat ironic, because I started the company so that I would be able to start a foundation. And then in the end, the, the focus of the foundation was what I learned starting the company. So um, it really is about empowering women. It's about setting them up with microloans. But mentorship is such an enormous part of that as well. And we have mentorship programs. Uh, the idea of peer-to-peer -peer mentorship is something we're really starting to focus on and see how women can start helping themselves. I was uh, recently, about three months ago, uh, introduced as a woman CEO. And I got up and I started laughing. And I said, you know, I've never heard of a man introduced as a man CEO. <laughs> and that, <laughs> it's something um, that I was really surprised at. And when I meet with all these women entrepreneurs, number one, they're so inspirational. They humble me and they are incredibly bright. They have incredible business plans. But the one thing that I think they need work on is believing in themselves and knowing their self-worth and understanding that it's OK to be ambitious. We often talk about how ambition is not a four-letter word. It's a stigma that we want to rid women of. And I am ambitious, and I am ambitious for many reasons. And um, I want women to understand that we, in our own small way, will support them. Um, it's it's um, a time where I think it's for change, and it's something that I want to use our company uh, to get behind. 
We now have 2,000 employees, and 80% of them are women. And we look at that as a work, as a task force. And I, what's amazing to me is seeing how our, our employees are responding to our foundation and how our consumer is. And our customer is loving it as well. So um, always thinking about authenticity and how we have to be careful of marketing because that's not something we want to go near. And whatever we do for the foundation has to really be good for the company as well. So um, it's a constant thought process. We're uh, thinking about all sorts of initiatives, how to get the company behind issues that we can um, really uh, are meaningful uh, for change. And, th and that's something we spend a lot of time on. So thank you. Thank you. Anne. Um, I think I'm the person on the panel whose philanthropic uh, involvement is basically through nonprofit boards. And I've served on many boards uh, with many different aims, the environment, education, uh, public television, um, classical music, now the Aspen Institute and the Ascend program that Ann Mosley has founded. And so you might think, well, what's the common thread? But there is one. And it starts about um, 30 years ago when my husband and I spent nearly a decade in the Middle East. And that was after growing up, spending my first two decades of life in the Midwest in Des Moines. And you, you can't imagine the contradictions between living in war-torn Beirut and divided Jerusalem, and then uh, my background of coming from Des Moines where everyone I knew went to the public schools. All the parents I knew were active in civic affairs, in public life, and then moving to a place where people didn't speak the same languages, they didn't interact, they certainly didn't go to the same schools. So, we moved back to the United States in 1988, and I decided I needed to give back. I needed to do something to support community. That was the great thing about America, uh, that I had seen societies where it was lost. There was no communal feeling at all. And what institutions do we have in America that bring people together? Schools, public schools and the military. So I decided to support education and the public schools. Um, both Tom and I are products of our public schools. Our daughters went to public school in Montgomery County, and then I got a teaching degree and went to teach in the public school system. So from there, um, I started joining boards, started giving to different educational organizations, nonprofits in Washington, and eventually became the chair of the Seed Foundation. And we are the parent operating body of the Seed Schools, which are public college prep inner city boarding schools for at-risk youth, grades 6 to 12. And um, we just, I, I really hesitate to say I, because everything that we support, it's my husband and I, but we really love the boarding school model because that's creating community. Just what we saw was needed in the Middle East. Uh, these schools provide nutrition, they provide a safe environment, they provide adult nurturing, uh, tutoring, homework help, all the things that more affluent students take for granted that come at home. And um, in addition, I've been very active with conservation in, and have served on the Board of Conservation International. And there too, I've, I've tried to bring my perspectives as a, a teacher to my work there and have founded a, a women's conservation forum that brings together about, uh, altogether, 600 different women who've attended our forums on different topics on the environment. And I'll stop there. Thank you, thank you. Anne. Well, first of all, thank you for letting me horn in on this panel. Um, I'm kind of shy, so it was sort of awkward to ask if I could take part. But 
Um, my cancer advocacy work, other than raising my two daughters, is really the most important work that I've ever done. <clears throat> and I didn't want to miss an opportunity to share with you all a little bit about it, especially because my most recent effort, Stand Up to Cancer, was started by nine women. I always say hell hath, hath no fury like some women pissed off about the pace of cancer research. And that was the case for us. But <clears throat> when I, um, you know, I have a lot of causes I'm very interested in, education, uh, women's rights, global equality, giving opportunities to girls worldwide. Um, and, but, uh, and when I was on the Today Show, I used to be asked all the time, can you MC this event, MC that event, osteoporosis, Parkinson's, Children's Aid Society? I'd be like, yeah, sure. But I never really felt I had a singular cause that I could be uber passionate about. And of course, my cause came from personal loss. My husband, Jay, uh, for people who watched the Today Show back in the day, probably remember, uh, <clears throat> died of colon cancer when he was 42 years old and I was 41. That was, believe it or not, almost 15 years ago. And uh, I realized that I had a built-in bully pulpit from which I could educate the public and increase awareness. And from that, from my on-air colonoscopy, which I'm sure you all really enjoyed, <laughs> maybe remember, um, I decided I wanted to start money, raising money for research for colon cancer because at the time it was one of those cancers like breast cancer was several decades ago that people just didn't talk about despite the fact it's the number two killer of men and women in this country. So <clears throat> under the auspices of the Entertainment Industry Foundation, which is the philanthropic arm of Hollywood, and Lisa Paulson, who's become a very close friend, I started the National Colorectal Cancer Research Alliance where we could cut through the cumbersome uh, grant process you have to go through when you're getting money from the NCI and raise money and give, them to, give it to um, very um, wonderful scientists that are working in all sorts of areas from diagnosis to prevention to treatment because um, Jay died within nine months because there, were, there was only one treatment option at the time for stage four colon cancer. So from, so that's where I really put my efforts. We had a lot of uh, fundraising events. We raised um, almost $30 million for colon cancer research. But then a few years later, I felt that I was really being greedy, just focusing solely on colons. So I decided we needed to focus on all kinds of cancers. My sister Emily died of pancreatic cancer two years after my husband died. So, um, you know, our family has really suffered a lot, and Jay's mom died of ovarian cancer. So um, I got together with these women, kind of crazy women like me, including Sherry Lansing, who was the head of Paramount, Laura Ziskin, who is a Hollywood producer, who actually was a Hollywood producer, who lost her seven-year battle with breast cancer last year. Her last movie, Spider-Man, will be coming out next week, by the way. Lisa, who, who I mentioned, uh, is the head of the Entertainment Industry Foundation, and a number of other women who have expertise in marketing, public relations, and science, and just really all kinds of different areas. So we started this organization called Stand Up to Cancer because we knew that one in two men and one in three women would be diagnosed with this disease in their lifetime. And we weren't, we weren't content with the pace of scientific research or progress that was being made. So we ha we've had, we'll have our third fundraiser, which is televised, sort of a, a strip show, not that kind of strip show, across all the networks and all the cable properties where we've raised, um, so far, $180 million. But what we have done is changed the paradigm in the way cancer research is done. Basically, we have dream teams of scientists from various um, academic institutions, from Harvard, MD Anderson, Hutch, the, you know, all different uh, uh, centers all across the country and some biotech firms where they pool their um, experience and wisdom and resources. And we decided if two heads are better than one when it comes to cancer research, 10 heads are better than two. So the mandate is in order to get a grant from us, they have to collaborate. Teamwork has to be exercised. And that really is our mantra and the value that we try to espouse and stand up to cancer. And so as a result, we have a pancreatic cancer dream team, an epigenetics dream team, a women's cancer dream team, and together they are making incredible progress. It is really exciting to see the science that is being done. And so um, we hope that this will eventually lead 
to, if, need, if not, treating cancers, various cancers as chronic diseases, to actually coming up with some pretty exciting cures and treatments that will keep people alive and allow them to live longer and healthier lives. So. My voice. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a journalist, for, I've been a journalist for 20 years, and, and then uh, I was running as Ensemble Space and then Reuters Media, so a businesswoman too. And I have a conviction is that information, if it, if it reaches you at the right time with the right information, it can save lives, it can, it can empower you to do extraordinary things. So just one example, if tomorrow in Aspen, which I don't hope, you have a terrible earthquake. And all of us here, who are brilliant academics, brilliant women, and some men here, uh, uh, and uh, uh, you, know, you are a banker, you, you, you are a successful person, you are taken in this disaster, all <coughs> communications are broken, and you have no way to empower with yourself because you have no access to information. So if you can access the right information, like you know, where is the surgeon that can operate, where is the distribution of water or food, then you are empowered and you will help the others and you will save your life and the, the ones close to you. I call this information as a form of aid. I know I'm French, so I have this terrible accent, so I mean aid, A-I-D, because oh, I know oh. I cannot pronounce it well. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> So, so the, 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 this, this is a very simple concept, but I have taken, taken it in everything we do at the foundation, and we, we, we have just uh, uh, implemented it in different sectors. So one of the sectors is AlertNet. AlertNet is the biggest humanitarian, humanitarian website in the world with uh, huge traffic, and we cover humanitarian issues from every angle. And we are the ones who follow the disasters in Congo where, when everybody has left, we are there. We have now, uh, when I took over the foundation, there were three journalists. Today we have 25 journalists around the world covering humanitarian issues and covering also women's rights and corruption, which is such an impact on development in general. So, um, uh, with AlertNet, we created EIS, which is the service I described to you just before, which is the emergency information service. When the earthquake in Haiti uh, happened, we triggered the EIS. And what we did was to send journalists uh, in Haiti immediately. And instead of doing what they do all over the world, which is covering the story for the rest of the world, they went to seek the information, check the information, and disseminate it to the local population in their language. So that's one. In Haiti, we have done a lot more. And through Treslaw, which is uh, uh, another service we have created two years ago, and which is to spread the practice of pro bono worldwide and give a lawyer for free to fantastic NGOs and fantastic social entrepreneurs around the world, help them define their, their need for legal support, and then give them the best lawyer to do that. So we have developed that intensively. One of the programs we had was IT, again. Rape has been multiplied by three after the earthquake, just because it was a free run, because you were under tent. No electricity one year after under the tent, so uh, it was terrible. So law firms in six countries studied the, how they put an end to the impunity against rape. And then we went to give that research to the Haitian government, and this is now in the process of the law. The last thing I wanted to very quickly say is that we have a program on training of journalists. And my view is that you have to be always open to any, any opportunity that comes. And the foundation is very much a startup mentality. So uh, last year, we, tra we trained for the last three years a lot of journalists in Haiti, and uh, in, in Egypt, I'm sorry. And uh, last year, these journalists came to us and said, we have no independent website to cover the election. We have nowhere to turn. So it was in August, we went to find funders in Cairo, uh, and typically the American Embassy, the British Council, and a few others. Uh, and they funded uh, what is today Aswat Masriya, which is the only independent website in Egypt, in Arabic, obviously. And uh, it has been such a success with 10,000 unique visitors a day since it was launched in October that our funders have asked us to do uh, two years more in Egypt to follow the story. Thank you, Monique. <laughs>
last but certainly not least, Lori. Thank you. Um, so I, first of all, my friends in the room know that it's hard for me to talk about anything for five minutes. Um, so I have materials in the back of the room um, that will go in a little bit more deeply into the things that I want to talk about. Um, and like many people here, I was, I had the really great good fortune, and it was only good fortune, to be born into a family that was extremely philanthropic. Um, and I, so I had great role models. I've tried to pass that on to my children, and I told Jackie that at my daughter's recent wedding, not only was she registered on Amazon.com, but she was registered at Robin Hood. So, <laughs> and when I was thinking about my remarks, and I was thinking, well, how did family philanthropy um, affect what I do? And I thought, in my family, I, I was thinking, it wasn't called philanthropy, it was just called being generous. I thought it was in the days before spaghetti was called pasta, before <laughs> drinking water was called hydrating. Um, you, you just, if you had resources, you just helped others out. And I remembered years ago, I was doing research for um, a talk that I was on, and I read a book uh, that had written a, been a, about my family, which I had never read, and it, it told the story of my grandparents. So it was about 1900. They were getting their marriage degree. Um, sorry, their marriage. All these academics. On the, <laughs> their marriage. Their marriage license. And they were leaving the the place to get your marriage license. And a beggar came up and asked them for money. And they had very very little money. Um, their wedding was not like my daughter's. Um, and my and my grandfather reached into his pocket and gave half of what was in his pocket. So um, as I said, I'm fortunate um, that that was the background that I grew up in. Um, so why did I start the Laurie M. Tisch Illumination Fund instead of just doing what I called uh, check writing on steroids? Um, so about 30 years ago, um, I, with some others, some even in this room, um, founded the Children's Museum of Manhattan. After that, I was the founding chair of the Center for Arts Education, which put the arts back into the public schools. And during that time, I um, had the fortune of serving on many boards, um, and I, learned about this thing called foundations. And I had always thought you know, that foundations were these great big things like Carnegie, Ford, Rockefeller, Bezos. Um, but through my work at, in these not-for-profit boards, I realized that you, know, you could also have a much smaller foundation and be effective. So I decided that after running a bunch of these organizations, um, that's what I wanted to do. And people say to me, well, why did you start a foundation? I said, well, I looked in my closet. I saw I had enough black shoes, enough Tory Burch flats, <laughs> and I was fortunate to have time and resources. Um, and I wanted to be able to constant, not just write checks, but really concentrate on certain areas. Um, I see I'm running out of time. I wanted to talk a little bit about what has become one of the signatures of the Lorium Tisch Illumination Fund, which is the Green Card um, Initiative. So a couple, uh, several months after I started the foundation, I got a call from the mayor's office inviting me to come to a press conference. Um, I didn't know what it was about, and I didn't know why he invited me. I found out really quickly. Um, and he was announcing that a law was being changed to allow 1,000 green carts, these were mobile vending carts, onto the streets of New York. Um, and this was based on numerous studies that the Department of Health had done and other people had done about the um, huge, huge, uh, no surprise, huge disparities, health disparities in poor neighborhoods and in the Upper East Side and Riverdale. Just a couple of statistics in the obesity rate in Riverdale, in the Bronx, these are both in the Bronx, is 15%. In Mott ha Haven, South Bronx, 25%. Same with diabetes, 6% in Riverdale, 17% Hunts Point where the fruits and vegetables come from, and Mott Haven. So the mayor wanted to do this initiative to put 1,000 mobile vending carts onto the streets where, um, in low-income neighborhoods where there, in areas called food deserts where there was very, very little access to healthy food. So this was the first big grant at the Illumination Fund. Um, I'm proud to say there are now 500 carts out. Um, there are, I think we've created 875 jobs almost all of which um, are the jobs have gone to first generation immigrants. And I don't know how many of you here um, saw the film that we did on it last year called The Apple Pushers, um, but talked about the impact of this. Um, 
But just one other thing I want to say, you know, a lot of people who think about philanthropy are told, well, find your passion. Um, sometimes you don't know what your passion is. When in Katie's case, it was, you know, it's very obvious why it came, but sometimes you don't know what it is. And, and it's more like Nike, just do it. You know, I fell into the food carts. Because of that, we've devoted, um, we've just announced that we'll be devoting about three to four million dollars, about a third of the foundation's um, um, proceeds to lots of different areas, having health areas, having to do with food access, having to do with diet-related diseases, having to do with um, food banks, share our strength, revolution foods, et cetera. Um, so it's only a couple of years later, three years later, but it's become a great passion of mine. So I guess my advice that nobody asked for, <laughs> my advice <laughs> is, um, you know, sometimes you don't know what your passion is. The passion is, my mission at our foundation is access and opportunity. It's looking at the world that my kids have and thinking they've had, they've had great access to education. They've had great access to the arts. They've had great access to health. But they're not the only ones who should. And certainly where they were born and how they were born shouldn't determine that. So everything we do at the foundation is through the lens of access and opportunity. That's what my passion is. But I had no idea. I, I, I had some idea, but I didn't know exactly where it was going to play out. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Um, well, I'm going to give each of the panelists a moment to sort of think about before we move into conversation. What's the one sort of lesson learned, aha, or, or sort of um, short piece of advice they would have um, for the audience? And I'm sort of curious, how many of you in the audience would call yourself a philanthropist? Raise your hand. Okay. Um, how many of you would not consider yourself a philanthropist? Raise your hand. How many? Higher. How many of you have volunteered in the past year? So I see one person who is sort of put, you're putting your hand up and down. You're a philanthropist. You didn't know behind you in the blue shirt. Maybe you too. But, you, but I think sometimes we think of philanthropist as Andrew Carnegie. And I, I just think claiming the world of, of women philanthropists, I really do mean it. We could open up this, this tent into a circle, and there'd be many stories. And I think a lot of the women here have opened up how they've done their work and how so many of us are philanthropists, and, and that it's really about um, no us and them. And so I think about just some of the, the, the themes I heard across here was really the, um, the influence from each, in different ways throughout each of you, the influence of family and community both in how you choose to engage and how you, how you, from where you came and where you're going. The second piece is really how deliberate and intentional you all have been, both in terms of once you found your passion, whether it found you or you found it, and how you chose to go about it. I mean, Tori, really struck by how you've thought about your company from the beginning and some of the investors saying, you can't do it and be socially responsible as well, and just, no, I don't think so. They weren't investors. Uh, exactly, <laughs> clearly. Um, but you know, just how to push the paradigm and, and how you're thinking about that. And that also you all clearly share an entrepreneurial spirit. That going after where you can make a difference, entering a new market, a new issue, but really being dogged about not sort of saying we're going to do it the same old way. So with that stated, I'm going to just sort of, sort of round together. Lori, we're going to kick off with you because you get to get one more piece of advice. But okay. we're going to practice sound bite land, so make me look good like I would if I were Katie okay. um, and being a moderator. Um, so I guess since I do a lot of public-private partnerships, um, green card being the biggest right now, um, the lesson that I learned is about patience um, and about agreed-upon measures of success. Um, and just one very quick anecdote. I remember about a year into this, and we were, we were trying to put together a communications plan. And we had around the table lots of people. We had people from the city and, and people who were working on this initiative. And it occurred to me that everybody had a different, um, they had a different interpretation of success. The, the kind of facilitators who were helping were saying, vendors vending successfully. Somebody from the city said, well, we have 250 carts out there. I think that's successful. And I thought, well, it is successful, except that you had come to me for a grant for 1000 <laughs> So they got to me, and um, the answer I gave, I literally, the looks that I got, it's like I had said I wanted to put green cards on Pluto. I said, um, well, I actually think success looks like taking out the proposal that you actually sent to me and going through it and saying, <laughs> are we doing this? Um, and we were doing most of it. But it, so I think the two things that I would say is, number one, agreed upon measures of success, but also patience and flexibility 
flexibility, and it's a really fine line. You don't want to change the mission that much, but you know, this is, it's, it's, it's a little bit messy. It's, um, you don't, you know, we, we found out that 1,000 green cards might not be the right am amount. It may be 500. But the grantee, so you have to, you've got to be flexible with the grantees. They also have to be honest with you and say, you know what, we, we, this is new, it's entrepreneurial, we thought about it. Great. We've rethought it and maybe there's another way to do Wonderful. it. Wonderful, realistic partnerships based with mutual respect. I don't have a lot of patience. <laughs> <laughs> don't, work with, don't work with the government. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> So I have the big luck not to work with government <laughs> or, or, or with the UN <laughs> too much. So anyway, my, my, my piece of advice for what it's worth is that uh, know what you can do or where you are good at and then uh, go and get it and be very entrepreneur. If you have an idea, go and do it. If you, if you, we were discussing when I took over the foundation, it was the Reuters Foundation at the time, and, and we had separate programs on separate websites and I wanted to put everything on the same portal. So we brainstormed one morning and said, what is the ideal name? And someone in the team said, it's trust that we are about. Uh, you know, it's Reuters, it's trust, etc." So I said, okay, let's go and buy trust.org. So everybody laughed and said, well, doesn't exist. We bought trust.org for very little money to a shop in Texas. <laughs> Because, because nobody thought that it could be available. Uh, so dare and do it. The other thing is, uh, uh, and this is the example in Egypt, but it's another example. I was, I was looking for a big idea in the legal world because part of the company is Westlaw and, uh, and legal. Uh, and I was discussing with a lawyer who told me that he created the Pro Bono Institute in Washington 27 years ago, it's Jim Jones, and uh, that under the principle that the law firms that will be uh, members would give minimum two point, the equivalent of 2.5% of their revenue in free hours to people who cannot afford a lawyer. I thought this is remarkable and it works and he said yes, it works very well in a few countries. So the idea came immediately to create this marketplace for pro bono and spread the practice of pro bono worldwide and, and so there, once you have an idea, there, go and do it. Thank you, Manu. Katie. Um, I guess for me, I, I think that while I think you should just do it, I agree with, with what Lori said. I think having a personal connection to something, I mean, just as Merle was moved about social justice by seeing those photographs of lynchings when she was eight or nine, I think to really pour yourself into something, you have to be moved by it. And I had uh, you know, a front row seat on what was happening in the world of cancer treatment, where I thought the gaps were, the frustrations were in terms of research and research dollars. So I felt like I could use, translate that personal experience and really for the greater good. And that's why I did that. And that's, I also think one of the things that we all have in common is that we've all been very blessed and we have, we have a, a, a place to, to do this great work from. You know, we have achieved these positions and a certain status in life that we can really give back in, in, a, in a profound way. And I think that sometimes you don't have to be a TV anchor or a you know, fashion designer or come from an incredibly philanthropic family to really affect change. And you can build things from the ground floor up. I think you have to have, there's power in numbers and working together with teams. But, and, and I don't think anything is more gratifying than being a change agent and improving the lives of others. Thank you, Katie. Anne. I'm, I'm going to put my board leader hat on again because I would make a plea. If you are on a board and you have a passion and you want to fund something in particular with restricted funds, that's wonderful. But from a board leadership perspective, please also give unrestricted donations to that nonprofit. <laughs> you know, that pays for the lights to go on. That pays salaries for these incredible people that work and help you achieve your vision. And it also helps spread the word branding, marketing. So that's my plea. Thank you, Anne. Tori? Um, I'm just going to keep it short and sweet. But I, I would say never underestimate the impact of a small act and how 
it can help people and then other and then the women particularly because I've been working with them help other women whether it's a piece of advice uh, introducing them to a mentor or a loan uh, it really goes a long way and that's something that I think anyone in this audience can do is really have impact you Tori um, I'm thrilled to see how many people self-identify as philanthropists and all I will say is that I have found what I think all of you know as well and that is this work is so wonderful and you always get so much more from it than you think you give and so I think it's always important to remind ourselves that um, we are doing something of um, tremendous value and worth in this world and it's all right to enjoy it as well. <laughs> Thank you, Merle. Jackie, last word. Ooh, um, I would say that it's really important to make certain that you stay very close to those that, for whom you are working, for whom you are working with or for. I think that making a decision in an office setting, not having gone into the field to really see what's going on, is, is not a good decision. So those of you that, that are already doing that and all the hands that were raised, that really, I, what I was actually originally going to say was you, everybody here has something to give, so they should do it now, and it looks like everybody is doing it now. <laughs> but stay close to those that, that you're working with and for. Thank you, Jackie. Um, excellent job. I have to say, I think if we, um, just first of all, a great panel, so let's give a hand to these incredible women. So when I sometimes look at the G8 conferences or sometimes Capitol Hill, you don't ever get to look at this. And so I'm just sort of wondering whether eight men could actually have this conversation in 55 minutes or not. <laughs> Let alone we could create some jobs, change a few things. So I just, um, excellent job. And we have time for, um, with our room full of uh, philanthropists, to have questions and get some conversation going. Because I think what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to give, who has the mic? And I hope you're not just one person. Oh, you are one, and you are strong. Um, I was going to think, if maybe you can get a couple questions over here, maybe just try to get a few. And then we'll have um, the panelists try to respond to this, because we can get a couple out there. And then we'll move across the room to the best of our ability in 10 minutes. Um, so hands, wherever you see, maybe up here, got some folks. But we'll take a couple questions at a time, if that's OK. So keep them short, because so everybody would be great. And introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Patricia Cox. And I have a question for the panel at large. And that is, um, if you have had any particular success in harnessing the power of social media in what you do, crowdsourcing, that kind of thing, because I, I do see that as the wave of the future in terms of involving the greater public in our, in our work. Great, great. Social media over here or over there? Over there. Yep. yep. Hello, is it on? Okay. I'm Valerie Quirk, and I'm actually a Bezos Scholar. And um, for a young woman like myself, um, you're all the woman that we dream to be and really invigorate us to move forward. But how do we get there? You know, what is, what is our starting point so that one day we can maybe sit in your shoes and move the world in our own ways? Um, how do we get to that point? Great. Um, and a couple back there, and then we'll start some. Oh, sorry. I never get the mic. <laughs> uh, my name is Lauren Redding. I'm a senior journalism major at the University of Maryland, and I'm one of the scholars. Uh, this isn't really a question related to philanthropy, but you're such an incredible group of women. I thought I'd throw it out there. Um, I was just wondering what you all think the chances are of having a woman elected president in your <laughs> lifetime or in my lifetime. I'm only 20, but uh, I'm pretty cynical about the fact or the chance that that'll ever happen. So what do you think it will, will need to happen for that to happen? <laughs> Great. Pipeline, White House, social media. One more, and then we're going to go down the panel. I need, I, I, really. OK, so I'm going to be really quick. Stand up and yeah, just I'll speak loudly. Speak loud. I'm totally uh, breaking Catherine the rules. Olsen, Women's Sports Foundation. Thank you. Louder. Larry. Whole room. OK, uh, Catherine Olson, Women's Sports Foundation. I want to thank Katie and Lori for your support question. in our work. The question is, um, how you look at your giving policy versus programmatic. Good question. Great question. One more. Okay, oh. one more. Policy. Oh. 
What was the question? The question was, as they think about their philanthropy, philanthropy, how do they think about policy and program? And she thanked them all profusely. <laughs> Great. One back there. Do I have to stand? Yes, please. Okay. You don't have to sing, though. No, good. Yes, you want to. <laughs> good, 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 good. Thank you. Uh, my passion is about injustice and inequality, whether it's gay rights, civil rights, or gender discrimination. And um, I have been trying to raise funds and awareness about women's heart disease, which is, as a matter of fact, the number one killer in the world today um, for women and, by the way, men as well. And we're having a very hard time raising funds for research. Um, even though, let's say, it's not a contest of diseases, you know, yeah. breast cancer is horrible. But uh, last year, let's say 39,500 women died of breast cancer, but nearly 500,000 women died of heart disease. And as Dr. Murr says, who heads my Women's Heart Center at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles, she made us, when she was discussing something at a recent um, event, she said, look to your right and to your left. One out of two of you will have some sort of cardiovascular problem in your lifetime. And I was wondering what you think about why, when I was trying to raise money for this event, um, which matched what I gave, which was $10 million, I started by calling women philanthropists, and very wealthy women on the Forbes list, let's say. And I didn't raise a penny from a woman. All the money I raised, I was able to raise $12.5 million. But 10 of that million actually just came from men. Well, actually, the 12.5, I mean, came from men. Um, why do you think that is? Why is, uh, if you have a distinct passion, as you say, for your green cards or for this or that, why is it not possible to also be aware of this um, terrible position that women are in terms of the susceptibility to heart disease? Thank you. Thank Why you. do you think? Thank you, thank you. Um, we have, um, we're gonna be closing out in a moment, so I wanna give the panelists a moment to think about the themes of how does gender discriminate, how does a gender lens on different issues, health and other, what are some of the challenges and tensions there when you're really trying to bring women philanthropists to the table, specifically to the point Barbara just made? What are we thinking about? How are you thinking about leadership from sort of mentoring on up to the White House? How are you thinking about social media? And how do you sort of think about when you're making investments from policy, program, advocacy? And so what we're going to do um, in real soundbite um, is uh, I want to give each of you a chance to respond to what's the one that really speaks to you. Um, and so we'll close out with that being your final word. One thing I do want to say is um, the panelists have all said they have a little bit of time to stay in dialogue more informally for deeper. I have the wonderful job of being the moderator trying to move us along, so forgive me for that. Um, just trying to keep us on schedule. So um, I am going to start with Lori because she volunteered. <laughs> so role model I'm for me. Talk about, I'm going to address social media. Fantastic um, and a nice soundbite. And I think that, um, <laughs> so we have a, I, I think we have a very, very good website. Um, but I have, not but, I have a young person in our office who wants us to be doing much more. She wants us to tweet and Hulu and whatever those things are called. Um, I, I can't do it because I don't know what they are. But, but I said we have to be careful. So, the way, so one of the good, so we use the website not just to show our grants and what we do, et cetera, but we showcase the work of all of, all of our grantees. Um, on the other hand, because we don't accept proposals, we have to be careful about you know, what we do put out there. Um, but, but one great example, there's a very small organization, it was actually started by um, one of our partners at Montefiore, a doctor at Montefiore, and it's called Locarda, I think. And what they do is they, he actually developed, and we fund them, we, he actually developed this, um, some kind of website where, or an app, a website where the, the people who want to buy fruits and vegetables um, can somehow be in touch with the, um, 
I don't know if they're in touch with the vendors directly, but through this website they can see, because it's hard to know where they are. They could be on 197th Street, they could be somewhere in the South Bronx. So that's how we're using social media, not so, you know, really more to showcase the work of our grantees. Great. Very quickly, um, and then quickly on social media. Uh, maybe on social media, very quickly, it revolutionized completely communications. Everything goes through social media today. So if you have something really impactful to say, do tweet it, etc. Just one example: two weeks ago, we published a poll on the ranking of the G20 countries on how is it to be a woman in these countries. And the best one was Canada, and interestingly, uh, United States was only number six. Uh, and the worst one was India, even worse than Saudi Arabia. And we speak of the G20 countries, so not the Scandinavian, etc. And uh, Nick Kristof tweeted immediately this result, finishing by a question. And his question was, do you agree? It went ballistic. He has 1,200,000 followers, it went crazy. And in India, one of his followers is a managing director of a very big corporation in India. He retweeted it from Nick, saying, this is worse than an S&P downgrade for India. And it went like this. So the impact of social media is considerable. It drives people to your website. It drives, it, it drives the conversation. So use it as much as you can for, for the good. Thank you, Monique. Jackie. Uh, social media, we use it um, mostly with our, our high schoolers. We started a program called Students Rebuild, which is to gather youth worldwide around issues. And um, we challenge them through social media um, to, to do acts of kindness for uh, their peers worldwide. And after the tsunami in Japan, we put out a call for 100,000 paper cranes, and we got 2 million. So, and we monetized all two million of them. So, the power of social media is, is strong, and uh, particularly with young people. Wonderful. Thank you, Jackie. We are getting definitely the sign, so I'm going to answer Ms. Dreisand's you question. You sure can, and then I'm going to do one <laughs> sentence about the other piece. So, okay, very really quickly, quickly, very quickly. Okay. You need to get a lot of women involved in your cause. You need to increase awareness because if people aren't aware of the issue, they're not going. I don't know why women philanthropists, did, did, philanthropists didn't support you. That's kind of perplexing to me. But you need to have an awareness campaign. It takes a village. Reach out to all those people you know in Hollywood who care deeply about this issue. And most importantly, Come on my new talk show this fall. <laughs> we'll, have, we'll spend an hour. We'll spend an hour talking about women and heart disease. Awesome. <laughs> and are you good? Are you good? Tori, do you want to say something? Okay. All right, then we'll give you the last word. Um, okay, and okay. excellent. And on the last word, because I cannot let us leave without just a last word on leadership. So Merle Chambers is going to wrap us up. Okay. Here is my view of when we will see the first woman president. I have always thought this is a Nixon to China moment. I think the first woman president we will see will be a Republican because that will be less frightening to our country than a Democratic woman president. And let me tell you, I speak as a passionate Democrat. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, as the Aspen Institute nonpartisan thing, we thank all of our panelists. Merci beaucoup. Thank you.